and we're live. Welcome to another episode of No Man's Land, specifically Under the Helmet. I'm joined tonight by Mr. Dark Leftovers. Mr. Dark, you want to say hello? Hello, everyone. Of course, I am Kaz, and we are going to be going a little bit off the beaten path tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking about game design, which is kind of a, a weird subject subject for us, us what I'm going to call a subcast that's really focused on leadership and leadership development. Uh, but Dark and I have been talking a little bit about this intermittently over time, and we've got the community that's a little passionate about this subject right now as they look at the current state of Foxhole, the current state of development in the game, and so we figured we'd talk about it, share some of our thoughts about uh, what we know and kind of what we don't know. Uh, our agenda is to give a, a real quick disclaimer this evening because it's important to, to set some things on the table. We're going to talk. Clear. Yeah, be very clear right at the start. We're going to talk about the gameplay loop, some considerations that we need to be, you know, very, very respectful of uh, within that gameplay loop, and some hazards with the gameplay loop. And then, really, the main thing that we want to take some time tonight with is talking about uh, the developers of Foxhole, the game, Foxhole developers' design philosophy, and some feedback for. You know, either that team or our feedback on where there may be strengths and where there may be weaknesses and some things that we think should be considered as uh, players in the scene here, right? And so we'll we'll see how that goes. Uh, so right, moving right into the disclaimer, and so I hope that we don't cut our own feet out from under us here, as uh, as we were kind of talking about before. But uh, but neither Dark or I have ever developed a game, right? Right at the game, we do not truly really know or understand the complexities that go into that design process, uh, and completely understood that game balance and design is exceptionally difficult. But at the end of the day, our opinions are not completely irrelevant in this space because Dark and I both have, I mean, countless years as consumers of the product and as competitors competing, you know, and trying to win in, in these in these scenes. And so we, we do have, I think, an above average knowledge of, you know, what a good product looks like and what makes a product good that we intend to talk about tonight. Uh, Dark, anything that on this on this that you'd like to add? I know that this one's kind of a little, little weird to kind of talk about because neither of us are truly experts in this space. No, and even even with that being said, even experts or even AAA game companies that you know that even try to establish some form of balance even struggle with that, you know. And uh, it's it's something that really it's really hard to really get perfect balance in anything and it's not really to be expected you know when you know there's always going to be unbalanced issues but i guess it, it really just matters how it's tackled or handled but you know i mean at the end of the day just understand we we're not experts we're just people who passionately enjoy the game and, and enjoy what we do absolutely so moving right in then let's talk in we're gonna spend most of our time talking about the gameplay loop and so what I mean by this, just to kind of define the term, is most games, really all games, kind of create a loop of gameplay that repeats itself over and over again to create an experience. Some of those loops are more complicated than others, uh, but at the end of the day, those gameplay loops sometimes are little five to 10 second repetitions, or they may be full multi-minute repetitions that the game tries to reproduce for you over and over again, because in, de in the design process, they found that this process is fun. And so if we reinforce this fun process enough, then the player has fun and they continue to engage with the product. And you know you can simplify some of your sub processes within your game into a series of loops and assess those loops to see what's working well and what's not working well. What is creating joy and what is taking joy from the game? What is taking away from that experience? And there are you know when you really think about it in those terms, there are countless spaces. And you know, we'll use Foxhole for some of our examples here. And Dark, I'd love for you to weigh in on some of these as well and kind of give me some feedback on kind of gameplay loops that you see that may be either positive, neutral, or even net bad. Uh, but, you know, I look at even uh, yeah, the infantry, infantry side of things because that's what I love. But, you know, the infantry gameplay loop for me is, I, you know, I spawn in, I get my equipment. That's a part of my experience. I maneuver on that battlefield either by, you know, rolling my face on my keyboard and pressing W or by flanking or repositioning, but there's some maneuvering, a maneuver phase. There's an engage phase. And then there is, sadly, every single time, a perish phase to my life. And then we rinse and we repeat this gameplay loop. And everything that you experience falls into this gameplay loop, from your respawn time to the time it takes you to pull your equipment to the time it takes you to maneuver on the battlefield and the experience of maneuvering on the battlefield and to the way that the engagement feels. And so even firing your weapon, in a, in a very simple sense, in the strictest sense, creates a gameplay loop. And there are things that play into this, such as the visual effects, the audio effects, and the reliability. And all of these things are critically important to measuring and influencing how players enjoy their experience. In fact, a large number of players uh, 
take specific great pains to have mods brought into the gameplay, into the, even this Foxhole game, to man change the audio effects to make their player experience more enjoyable. And so all this minutia, all this stuff comes together to either bring joy or take joy from the experience. Um, and so, so Dark, if it's all the same deal, I'd like to pause for a second and kind of get some of your thoughts as you kind of think of some of the gameplay loops that, that you interact with here. Kind of, what, what, are, what are some thoughts that come to mind? We got we got a similar one for pretty much artillery. It's kind of the same thing as as your infantry gameplay loop is you know, you, you equip, maneuver, engage, and I, I would say you could probably replace perish with with just result of whatever you you know like the aftermath. You get me like either you kill right. the target, you miss, or you get destroyed. And after that, it's just rinse and repeat. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's the uh, a lot of that ties down to like you know when you fight when you when you walk around. Does it feel good when you move, when you get the equip, equipment moving? Does it sound good when you fire? Does it sound good? Is it reliably, you know, satisfying to use? It's a complicated use. And it's like all these things take a good into a good consideration factor. I think currently right now, our, well, I mean, it's not, a, it's not a shocker for me. And I know it's not the focus, but the artillery is definitely uh, something I feel like it's, it's right now at a very simplified state. And mm -hmm. it almost has no satisfaction. The only ever satisfaction you'll get from artillery is just finally either sniping a vehicle or like destroying a mega a mega structure complex. You know, I mean, like something yeah. with like twenty bunkers, and you destroy it and you just get that loud like sound. You know. Yep. But other than that, it's like even sniping a vehicle it, right now is a fifty fifty, especially how repair, repair mechanics go. They could easily like out repair AP, uh, APFA, so it's it, it's definitely it's a not a good one at least for my taste right now. Well, and here's something that's really interesting about it. And I don't know how you would do this in the context of Foxhole very well. It'd be a huge redesign. But I remember I had a friend who tried uh, who tried Foxhole quite early in the game, uh, like early in my experience with the game anyway. And he hated a lot of things about the gameplay experience. But I remember one criticism he had about it specifically is he he loved the concept behind artillery. But the gameplay experience, the gameplay loop for him was completely unenjoyable. He wants to fire this big gun, but he doesn't get to see what he destroyed. Like, he doesn't get to visually enjoy the results of his labor. He doesn't get to see the guys flying everywhere. He doesn't get to see the explosions landing. He's like, well, dude, what the heck is this? This is stupid. And he, he immediately walked away from the experience because to him, that part of the gameplay experience was so lost that it couldn't be enjoyed. The gameplay loop was missing something critical for him to enjoy the game. Uh, and so other people that play artillery, and I, you know, I think if you think about it, I'd love to kind of hear some of your thoughts on this because a certain person is attracted to arty and a certain person is kind of attracted to Foxhole in general where they don't necessarily get to enjoy the fruits of their labor all the time. They don't get to visually see the fruits of their labor and that takes away from the gameplay experience for a lot of players. Yeah, you know what, it, what you're saying is completely 100% true. And a lot of the times, a lot of people gunning or even like myself, you know, putting myself in those shoes back in the early stages of artillery. It's definitely a like you hoping the spotter is leading you to victory. Like everything you're doing, that pinpoint accuracy, the responding, is all coming to good effect. In fact, it's actually like a benefit we have Discord, you know, where you can actually share your screens, mm -hmm. and now they can actually see what what the spotter sees, so they get to enjoy that. It, it, it's an interesting thing, like they get to enjoy that loop. And just to change games for a bit, War Thunder kind of has that that thing you know when you shoot when you shoot against a tank you don't see it but you get a little diagram of where you hit it and if it did critical damage or whatnot yeah and that's definitely something that's very you know enjoyable i don't really see it in a sense for foxel because it's definitely it's a it's an interesting thing but I, I get what you mean because many things could factor into it like just say for example if um you know if you're using a field gun and it destroyed a tank you have your spotter saying yeah you destroyed a tank then how would it feel later on to like push your gun forward and you see the you know the remains of right, that tank right, right, right there and it's like oh yeah hey guys that's that's the tank you took down and it's like an enemy bt and it's like oh you know what i mean like if i was a private i'd be like oh damn dude like that's crazy mm -hmm. and that's a pretty good part of the gameplay loop but you know a lot of games like that have indirect fire you usually build some kind of feedback in so that the player knows they're doing something and it's like subtle things like i think of like hell let loose they have indirect fire in that you don't see the results of your explosion but you do get you, you do get kill indicators right like you can you can kind of get oh, yeah. you know, oh, some yeah. you get some feedback that you're doing uh, a, a way really a way to monitor that you're being effective personally 
and it's and it, it, it's very selfish. And the only thing about gameplay loops, especially in video games, is you have to appeal to kind of the selfishness of the player here. And I think this may come up in the design philosophy later, but if you don't make an account for that, you're going to lose a lot of players. Yeah, because it's definitely like if you keep someone satisfied, I mean they're, they're going to keep they're going to keep wanting more, you know. And it's something as simple as like, and, and this is a minor thing because this this affects. Um, this affects scrapping. I know they like recently added this, and it's because like you know we have gathering games like Rust, and when you hit something, you get a little indicator of mm -hmm. you know how much. That's it. It doesn't solve the issue, but it it's one of those things where you get an immediate effect rather than just hitting something and getting nothing. Right. You get a little pop up on the bottom left of your screen that you got this, and it's one of the, it's like little things like that that you know it doesn't save that whole element, but it makes it a, like a little bit better. Yeah, and I think you know farming scrap is a, is a gameplay loop in Foxhole that I think very rightly gets a lot of criticism, a lot of attention. And there are a lot of examples of games that have grind mechanics, if I could call that it, that that functionally work around that loop. So you brought up Rust. I'll talk about Rust. I love Rust. Rust is one of my favorite games of all time. Mm -hmm. And and I didn't mind farming in Rust. And it wasn't you know oh, because yeah. because farming in Rust was wasn't tedious there was because there, there was a significant element of risk and survival associated with a farming run like you knew that you could go out farming and there was a very high probability that you weren't coming back from that experience if you weren't on your toes you weren't playing smart you weren't watching you weren't prepared for a fight at any second and so it kept you on your awareness and foxhole if you're farming in a location that's not perfectly safe, you're doing it wrong. You know what I mean? And so you can literally be asleep at the wheel doing something that literally a bot could do. Uh, and, and there's no, it's not, it's not a very rewarding experience. The gameplay loop is not very rewarding. There is the end outcome of getting a product, if you will, you get a resource, uh, but many would argue that what you, for the time investment that you put in, what you receive is not worth that effort for the vast majority of players. It's, it's not rewarding enough to be engaging and to draw enough players to the activity. It's the simple fact of grind versus fun. Are you spending more time grinding than you are having fun? And that's like, you know, what I mean, like, if you ask any other person, you know, what 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 would you think would be the balance? The balance. What what should have more percentage over the other? Mm -hmm. You know. And that's the thing. Again, come back to Russ. Let's think about Russ. Like, I I treasured the farming runs that were uneventful. <laughs> I was able to safely smash my rock against a tree or or find something, and then I was able to bring that haul back unmolested. That was that was excellent. Like because the alternative was you know was a fight for my life, blood you know blood pump pumping kind of moment, right? And so it's it's just so interesting the way that they built that atmosphere into the gameplay loop to make something that was on paper quite tedious. Very, very enjoyable, at least for me, and the way I the way I played and enjoyed it. Um, and that, but we could we could go on it. Dark, any other thoughts on this before we continue? No, I think we can just go to the we can go to the next slide. So let's talk about some considerations that kind of come into play on what makes a gameplay loop either good or bad. Uh, and so first things first, how long does that activity slash loop take? When you know the life cycle of the loop, how long does it take? And so let's finish the analogy that we just had with a scrap run. You know, a scrapping run, if I could call it that, as a total gameplay loop, takes a long time. It's very difficult to come, you know, to go down, sit down, do that, and then, and then log off effectively. If you're trying to do a very comprehensive and effective uh, scrapping run, it, it's not something that that happens quickly at all. There's there's very different. It's it's too difficult to engage with. And so, one possible criticism, one possible benefit, is to reduce the amount of time needed to engage with that activity for it still to be completed. Um, at the end of the day, the next question, what experience does it provide the player? What is the incentive for that player to keep coming back to it? And incentives are a very, very important thing in games, are you okay? And there are, there are a couple of incentives that are very um, common that we'll talk about here in a second. But ultimately the, over, ultimately, the overall player experience has to be positive. It must be positive in some way. Uh, or it's negative, and therefore people are only going to do that for so long, right? And so two of the most common ways that you see this occur is... The, imperial, the, the players that interact with this loop gain something, okay? And there are a variety of ways that games build in uh, rewards, and some of those things are even just psychological or like fake rewards, like achievements even, right? Like, I mean, they, they, <laughs> there are a number of different things that kind of come out to try to engage players and give them something to show for their effort and energy. And so progression is a common one. I think this would be a wonderful thing to talk about. I think progression has been talked about in Foxhole before, but, you know, in the context of Foxhole, there's essentially no progression for your effort. Um, outside of what you contribute to the overall war effort, there's no real 
uh, progression in the game, either through intrinsic wards to you, uh, uh, you know, unlockable equipment. I guess tech is technically progression, uh, but the underlying gameplay loop associated with grinding that progression is so negative that it's not worth the reward. Uh, and it's not even a reward that's intrinsic to the player. It's a reward that's just native to the faction, and that's going to happen whether you play or not eventually. And so, again, selfishly, that player doesn't gain a lot of real value, doesn't gain a lot of reward from participating in that activity. And then the next level is progression through proficiency and competency development. And this is more in a competitive sense, but activities that are challenging, the activities that are, um, that are precise, engage the player in such a way that they feel growth in their development. They see themselves improving, they see demonstrate, they see evidence of their improvement, and either, and just to give a couple examples, either through their mechanical precision at the activity, uh, reduction in reaction times from doing the activity enough to get better at it, whatever it is, but they see themselves get better ultimately. They, they become more skillful in the domain and there's a reward in that. And so one of those two things really should happen in one manifestation or the other for the gameplay loop to be sustainable, to continue to attract players back. And if neither of them happen, the probability of that activity being done over and over and over again goes down dramatically and player engagement goes down with it. And so, I mean, I'd love to think through some examples of this because I think there's a lot of other games that do this very well and illustrate this principle. Uh, but Dark, what kind of immediately comes to your mind? For games, right? Yeah, sure. So a good one uh, would be, and it's kind, of, it's kind of funny when we talk about it, is Dota when we get to uh, Last Hitting, right? And that, and that Last Hitting itself is a gameplay loop. And it's such an interesting thing because it's very important for your five to ten minutes. Uh, just just a quick disclosure for those of you who don't know what Dota is. It's pretty much a uh, it's a MOBA. What was it? I was about to say I was about to say a bunch of other stupid genres. Of what it is, but it's very on the League of League of Legends and Smite for those of you who play those games. And so last hitting is when you last hit a creature and you get rewarded for hitting it. And in your early stages of the early game, which is about five to ten minutes when a match starts, it's very crucial for you to get these hits. You know, if you're not making these hits, you're not getting money and you're not going to be progressively getting stronger towards the later in the game. And a key to think that everything about it is very uh, positive on it. I lost your dark. I think Dark maybe had some technical difficulties, but to, to kind of continue on Dark's thought, yeah, everything about that last experience is is positive to the player. There's like a lot of cues that reward that player. And it actually accomplishes a little bit of both, if you think about it, both of these progression things happen in this experience. And that when you hit that last hit, you get you know the visual thing, like the money pops up and spins, you get a nice audio cue. It, like, it, it tickles the brain in really weird ways. I guarantee somebody put a lot of thought and energy into those like really simple things. It gives you progress within the game, so to speak, so your character is progressing within the context of that gameplay loop. And then the actual proficiency of doing last hitting is not easy. And, and no player, except for the, like, the grandest of masters, have really truly mastered it. And there's always, like you can see yourself getting better and more consistent with it. Uh, and, and so it, it really is like the definition of a really excellent gameplay loop that keeps people coming back to it for both of these reasons because of how well it's designed. And it's a gameplay loop that repeats itself on a small thing. It's a simple gameplay loop. It happens rapidly and over and over and over again, and so players can interact with it uh, in a in a variety of ways and continue to experience and enjoy it. It doesn't take an overly a, like overly long amount of time to enjoy that part of the gameplay loop. And so I'm, I'm with, I think Dark's that that's an excellent example. And let me know, Dark, when you're when you're back. I think that you dropped off there, but thank you, thank you for picking up where I dropped off. Uh, yeah, I sure. Don't know where where I fumbled there, but thank you. Um, I mean, what more what more should we should we discuss more on just like what things we could what things we could suggest or implement or what do you think right now yeah no i mean i think that if we want to spend we can spend the rest of the evening talking through other gameplay loops that games have i think the point is well made though and, and i really like i think to start stay focused on on foxhole and the gameplay loops in foxhole that are positive or the gameplay loops in foxhole that we feel are a little negative and I think some of the balance decisions that have made, we'll talk about this here, I think, close to then, so I, don't, I guess we won't get into it now, but some of the design chases that are being made for the game are, in my opinion, negatively affecting the gameplay loops for a variety of different players that interact with this game. And I, and I think it, it makes sense for us to explore what those reasons are and talk through them. Uh, so moving on to kind of the last thing, let, let's talk about some of these gameplay loop hazards. Uh, and then we're going to really spend some time talking about the development strategy of Foxhole, where it's going, and kind of our thoughts about it. 
Uh, but gameplay loops that are hazardous are ones that involve grinding, right? We brought up Rust earlier as a risky, I mean, in my opinion, that's a risky gameplay loop, having that kind of farming in there, but they've done a lot to mitigate the risk of that gameplay loop through other means. But you've gotta be super careful about repetitive and tedious activities that artificially extend engagement with your game. So even in Rust, when you go out on a farming run, that farming run, depending on how manic you are, is, is a 15, 20 minute run, or you know, no more than 40 minutes if you're going really crazy. If you're doing grinding in Foxhole, you can grind for hours trying to get to what you're trying to get done. And that's that's where the grind becomes oppressive, where it's becoming, quote unquote, a second job. You've heard a lot of people say that Logi shouldn't be a second job because people are literally putting hours into that gameplay loop trying to grind out to participate in that process. And as a result, it, it's, it's too much. You gotta be careful about the complexity. And we're gonna be talking about complexity here in a minute, but unintuitive and opaque processes and functions are too complex and it, you shouldn't be afraid of complexity because games that add complexity are great but those games have to have that complexity in a place where it can be rationally and reasonably understood and discovered and we'll talk about that in a second as well and then last but not least as i've already emphasized an absence of incentives incentives are critically important and uh, one, one of the main rules of hr actually if i want to bring this back to our management leadership thing here so we'll get one nugget of wisdom here is people respond to incentives period that's all like one of the most fundamental laws of hr is people respond to incentives. It's also true in games and in game development and game design. What you incentivize is what you get, and what you disincentivize, you get less of. And right now, we have a series of gameplay loops that disincentivize participation. And as a result, you see player retention, player engagement go down in a variety of places in this game because so many activities are disincentivized through uh, game design that I do not believe is speaking to a engaging process. Uh, so, Dark, any, any thoughts on the gameplay hazards? We're starting to accelerate a little bit, kind of getting to the uh, to the cake here. But uh, <laughs> potatoes of the whole stream. <laughs> potatoes of the whole stream of what we're trying to run to. But I don't want to I don't want to do an injustice or an injustice here. Any, anything that kind of comes to mind on these hazards that you that you, you got top of mind? We we go to the loop of scrapping, you know, and this is just one. It can go from a uh, bless you, sorry. We can go to the loop of getting scrap to getting sulfur or to getting components. Those are the, the three main ones. And you can go in and divide into the nitty gritty of, you know, most of them you can't even scrap for them until half the game, until you lock sledgehammers. Now you can scrap all day and the only thing you might get, and you might get lucky to get some, some of the, the new tech resources that progress. But even then you get so little, you have to really communal and, and pull your, your stuff together. And it, I don't know, it's just the whole general of it, it, like the fact that they tied it down to already a a grindy system that pretty much relies on your faction to, you know, if, if no one's grinding, then guess what? You're not, you're not teching. And it's like, sure, you could say that's an incentive on its own, but it's a forced, you, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's a forced, mm -hmm. like, don't do it, you're going to lose. It is. And it's, it's not something the player gains from at the end of the day, right? Again, I, I'll bring it back to selfishness because selfishness is important to realize. People play games to enjoy themselves, not to give their life to Callahan, okay? I hate to say that. That's heresy. We, we, like, to, we like to build a lot of motivation and enthusiasm. But in the strictest sense, people play this game to enjoy it, not dedicate their lives to slavery. And that's kind of what happens is p assholes like me benefit from the guys that sacrifice their time to do the grind because I'm not doing it. I'm going to confess right now very boldly. I'm selfish. I'm not going to take my personal leisure time to go in and hammer away at something for a few hours. It's just not going to happen. And and so what happens when you do that is I glean the rewards and benefits of your hard work. And that's not that's not a great gameplay loop. <laughs> I mean, for the person who's doing that, it's not a great deal for them. Not a great deal at all. Uh, any other thoughts before we continue, Dirk? Shocked right now, you cursed. Yeah, well, first time for everything. We hope. God, no, <laughs> well, I'm stunned. I'm stunned. <laughs> Moving right first along. Time I've ever heard. Uh, all right, <laughs> let's talk design philosophy for a minute here. Here we go. Design philosophy. So this slide, dark. I forgot this slide even existed. I think on our previous No Man's Land, we spent a cursory amount of time talking about this, and I'd like to. I, and I'm so glad Dark mentioned this and brought this up because it's really. Yeah, it's not with you, Fancy. This slide really gave me a little bit of concern uh, about some of the comparisons that are made. And I think it'd be productive to kind of go through and talk about these one by one. And, Can and, I? And, yeah, go ahead. I want to interrupt, but 
I just want to put a disclaimer. This was, I think, the philosophy that they issued out like a year ago. I could be correct. Was it already a year ago? Oh, I, man. I want to say so, but I just want to throw it out there. You know, now I'm saying things can change, but this is the last thing we heard from. This is their design philosophy, and th this is where we're basing it off of. And I don't it, think it's crazy to say that this has changed much. And that's something it's like, it feels like it hasn't changed. Like they're going base, basically off what they're saying. And so I, again, I think it makes sense for us to kind of talk through these things. And, and, and one of the things that I think I see, the first thing that I see when I look at this slide is I see trade-offs that I don't feel are trade-offs. Like I don't see a lot of these comparisons as mutually exclusive. And I think it's really important to understand why. And so Dark, I'm actually gonna kind of take a step back and, and let you, if you're, if you're willing, kind of take the lead on some of your initial thoughts here. You know, as we kind of look at these one at a time, and I'll, I'll kind of follow your lead on, on some of this, because uh, I'm really interested to kind of hear your your initial thoughts when you look at this these comparisons, what comes to your mind, especially from a game design perspective. Well, before before we get to the specifics, I, just looking through these, I'm like, you know, sometimes both, you know, both options could work per, in perfect unity. Yeah, they, they complement yeah. one another. Like, for, like, gameplay and theme, you can do that perfectly fine. Like, like, like for, for I like to go back to Dota, its theme fits the gameplay, and it, it and it it goes back and forth. You know what I mean? The gameplay is the theme of of, of Dota. It's like, I, it, it's one thing. It's like it's it's interesting, you know. And then going off to co-op and solo, if you have great co-op tools, you know, I, I don't know. It's it may, maybe it's a little bit. I'm a bit biased on that because I just feel like, if you're playing a millisim sim, faction styled game. Why are you trying to play it solo? It's not like Rust where you can be a faction of yourself. You, right. get, you get what I'm trying to come from from that. Like if you're in a team based sure. game, you're not supposed to be doing things by yourself. Like that's just you get me. It's like yeah. Once you know, once we get down there, I'll make an argument against that as well. Because I mean, I get what you're going at, and that of all the comparisons, that's probably the easiest to defend up here. But even then, I don't think that that it's exclusive. Like I don't think you have to choose one of the other per se. Um, there shouldn't be an argument or a like. Def, like there shouldn't be a discussion like like for, <laughs> oddly for one we're having right now is why is there why is this a discussion they're having mm -hmm. between these and that when it's just like like i guess we you just want to come down we can talk about player agency versus player mastery yeah and so one thing is where player agency from their definition is freedom for players to find new and unpredictable strategies versus the player mastery, players focus on mastering a rigid set of strategies. Now, it's like you can still be creative with the toolbox you're given, no matter what. As a player, people will do creative things no matter what, because people will find a way to change things. You get what I mean? It's like, that's what people find out what new metas are, no matter what. No matter, you can force this certain rule set and people will go outside if it works. You get, you get what I'm coming from? 100%. And I think Foxhole does actually operate quite well in this domain. I would probably in both domains. Again, I don't, I don't know why these are put side by side because I think both are very viable in the game in the universe that Foxhole has created. Uh, and you do see a great deal of player agency in in the ways that people choose to attack problems, experiment, and 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 do just jank stuff to try to find victories uh, from angles of attack to approaches and to the equipment and tools that they bring to the table. You do see a great diversity in that, but you also see a significant degree of mastery in players that master strategies that get applied in those in those things. And so it's very much mixed and matched in that, you know, we have people that have mastered, so to speak, the execution of artillery delivery. And the way that we choose to use those strategies, we sometimes use them in unpredictable ways, right? And so, again, I don't, these two don't stand against one another. And, and I like that. Again, I don't really have a problem with with either of these, and I think that there's room for both. Exactly. Exactly. And to me, it feels like one will breed out just from the other. You know, like like they work perfect together because, like, say for example, we have right now they are enforcing the colonial faction with their current vehicle lineup. It's more for a certain type of strategy you know you're meant to be flanking that's the general strategy behind their vehicles is mm -hmm. they're better and they perform better off-road catching the enemy off guard now it's something that unfortunately it, a lot of you know colonial players struggle to master that but they still use their vehicles in a you know 
unpredictable way, but it's still not the way it was meant to be. But you get what I mean? Like, they yeah. try to force that, but people are still either doing the old way or they're doing something even different from there. You know? you know what's really interesting about this slide now that you mention it? Is this most recent change with the tech tree, I think, has the delusion of giving players agency over tech, but it's it's more constrained than it is liberating because the tech tree is so rigid. Like, you have this delusion of choice between two alternatives, but it, it doesn't actually give you a lot of agency over what it is that you need or truly want to get to. And I think a lot of wardens have been really frustrated specifically with this war in that we have no agency to choose the options we need to deal with the current threats arrayed against us in this early game. Uh, Because we experienced a very challenging early game with Colonials bringing out some armor that we really struggled to have an answer for. We have answers in our tech tree for them, but they weren't accessible to us. And so our agency was kind of taken from us and we were forced to use our mastery (laughs) of of sticking grenades to try to keep our heads above water just to interact. And so I, I really think that and I know that I'm predisposed to not like the tech tree. I've got a lot of gripes with the tech tree and the way they choose to design the tech tree, which means I'm prejudiced to find holes in it. So I have to I have to be very open with that. Uh, but I do see it as being against their design philosophy at this point. Well, I mean, I, I, it's real funny with these. Like, we can really like each each line can have like its own hour just just based off this <laughs> Yeah. But I, I guess what I could say to you, what would you what would you think about for a closing statement just for player agency for player mastery would be at, at least a yeah well, I don't know how to go about this like suggestion or just one thing you would like to say or anything yeah so I think at the end of the day the the de- you know I, I want to give credit where credit is due and that the developers have built a universe where player agency is actually quite good and I think they I think they continue to embrace that you know for all of the opportunities with like bunker development. Bunkers and bunker systems gives players tremendous agency for how the world is designed, where hard points are, where choke points are. The way that they executed it leaves a little bit to be desired, in my opinion. But the agency that players have to make choices is way, way above average in this game. And that's one of the, one of the things that makes it beautiful and so attractive. And so I think that's great. I don't think that they put on the altar of sacrifice player mastery like this comparison says. I think that you see players master a great degree of different tactics in this game. Uh, and so I guess that would be my final thought. So I, I would give them some credit here. I just think they may have missed this design, like I, they missed the mark on this divine design philosophy yeah, in this design philosophy in some very critical places. Yeah, that's pretty well said. I don't, I don't think I have anything to really much on this on this certain line. I guess you want, you want to go with the second one. Yeah, yeah. You want me to lead this one? This one, then we'll just take turns. Sounds good. So so depth is one depth versus accessibility is one that really really grinds me wrong here uh, in that you can have depth and you can have accessibility. Once again, they're not mutually exclusive. And I'd like to kind of use the example because this was really well done. Uh, This won't be relevant for anybody, but I will try to explain it. But when Crusader Kings 3 came out, that is a game that offers unbelievable and incredible depth. There is tremendous depth to that game. And the Crusader Kings series is known for having an extreme amount of depth to it. What they did in the third game that they did better in the, than in the first two games is they expanded the accessibility without doing tremendous sacrifices to the depth of the game. And I think that that's something that is exceptionally hard to do. So it's easy for me to give gripes on this matter because it's not an easy accomplishment, but it is not... So You don't have to sacrifice accessibility to have good depth. And one of the criticisms that we have, that I have about Foxhole is that Foxhole does have very... I guess, good, strong, deep processes, but they are uh, opaque processes. They are, that is, they're not transparent. You can't see through them. You can't see what's going on behind the scenes, and they are very difficult to learn and to interact with unless you literally get associated with a group of players that have understood through pain and experience and their own scientific method how these things function. And so the de- it is you know artificial depth in that the accessibility to it is withheld from players because it's not clear to see what's going on. Let's take the armor system on armor as an example of this. That is a very, there's depth there, but there's also inaccessibility because there's no transparency into what's going on with that armor system. Like you don't know if your armor has been stripped off or not as a player. You, you just don't unless you intuitively have enough experience to know what's going on. And so that lack of transparency removes accessibility for depth, but unnecessarily so. You could have both. And so that, that that's, one, that's a 
that's a gripe that I have here. I feel like it's a a deflection from responsibility of adding accessibility to a game that could desperately use some accessibility. Um, and, and players could benefit from gaining more accessibility to these processes to appreciate and enjoy the depth the game offers because they are kind of cordoned off from enjoying that depth unless they get involved in the right places to be able to learn that depth to fully enjoy it. Uh, and so there are countless examples of that. I think I've said my piece. So I'd love to, again, I'd love to hear kind of your thoughts on that, Dark, but that, that's one that's really bothersome to me. In, in in a breath, yes, there's there is a lot of depth, but the thing is with it, it's not because the game tries to be, you know, cunning, is that there's just a lot of unknown information that the players themselves kind of pull together to share kind of like this tribal knowledge, you know. That's like a great when, word for it. Yeah, thank you, thank you. For every like good big patch you know, everyone passes this around because we you know we have people that do ch rigorous testings to like, you know, try to find out what's what really is this system. Like when the when the armor system first came out, people were trying it like, OK, what do you do? Well, we don't know. It, it chooses pretty much when it wants to bounce. You know, it's RNG. So what people have learned, like, OK, when you're in a, when you're in a vehicle, if you get hit three times, just assume you have no armor and just drive it back. Now, you know, you as, as a private, you only, you wouldn't even know, you wouldn't even assume, like, you wouldn't really understand. And that's like, it, it's the illusion of the unknown, because the game itself doesn't want to tell you, or there is no time for them to add that, you know, even it, it's something you could easily just do like a visual model, you know, it, it, depth doesn't have to be just simple, like, behind the scenes. You could just make depths just from you looking at something. Like we have some depth layers in when you attack structures. When you attack garrison houses, you have it turning from damage state one, two, three, four, twenty. You know, and it may not seem like much depth in in certain eyes, but you get me what I'm what I'm trying to go mm -hmm. with that. Absolutely, that certain layer of it. You know, you get a visual indication of how how damaged is it. You know, and going out down more than you know. This is what I'm saying. Like we have the opposite of death, of we have just straight up simplicity of, you know, you get a FA, you know, you put shells in it, you push it up, you fire, and it's like there isn't really real depth in that simple mechanic of that. It's like you don't really, you, you get me? Like you, you mm -hmm. get everything you you bargain for with that. Yep. And but there is depth in the tactical environment that supports that whole process. Yeah. Of course, when you when you get when you get to use it and all that you know it creates its own depth but a lot of it is more so like <sighs> i feel like in all these i just, I just get tongue-tied on myself man no you're good dude but, but i think what you're getting at is that it, it's it, it removes accessibility for the wrong reasons um it, it's not because everyone it's, loves knowing what the it's not because it's like a hard math equation it's because you don't know you don't have the privilege of the information and that and that's and that's that's a really poor way to sacrifice accessibility. Um, I think that's probably one of the most frustrating things of like the whole foxhole, what would, what would we call it? Career? Enjoyment? Experience. The whole foxhole experience is, I would say, I would, I would have just put this category just unknown. Like a good chunk of foxhole's experience to me was just not knowing what's going to happen. Or even what is happening, you know what I mean? Like, you don't really know much what's going on. You have a you have an assumption, but you just don't really know. I mean, like for example, like you have to do the hard math yourself. How many HEs does it take to crack open a bunker base? Right. And even that in itself, it's like you know, I mean, like, you know, it depends how many segments it has. Does it have this? Does it have that? And then it's like you know, it's a lot of things that. It's just it's a real frustrating, you know. Just you know the fact that there's a lot of questions and there are answers. Yeah, and and that and that's and that's exactly right. The the accessibility to the game is really difficult. And the only the only defense I can make is that you know this game still is in early access, and so I can understand that building robust models of explanations for processes for things that may change doesn't feel like an efficient use of time. But it is not unreasonable to expect certain user interface elements to be helpful uh, in exploring some of the depth in the game in a way that could help players see what it is they're interacting with. And I guess that's the only point I would make. Dark, any final thoughts on depth and accessibility that comes to your mind? 
one thing, and this is a this this is a little bit interesting because I'm really starting to like what they're starting to do with. Um, I'll start it with I think when it, when they first introduced the ballista and the uh, the RPG Jeep. I don't know what it's called. Yeah. But it has a limited inventory system, uh, a limited inventory that only holds X amount of shells. The mortar half track came out, could only hold 20 shells. And then the siege mortar came out. It could only hold a certain amount of shells. This, this, it's a little interesting thing. Cause it adds a little bit of depth of, you just can't smash as much shells as you can. And to me, I like, I enjoy that, that whole system of, especially with the, with the siege mortar in general. Cause I've always been a fan of just, you know, the, like, like I like to call it just the journey of like mm-hmm. for example firing a gun where you carry the shell you put it in the gun you load it and then you fire it versus just putting it in and firing it you get me it's like mm-hmm. I, I hold the instrument that's going to be shot out and it's something that's so <laughs> small you know it's like it, it's one of those things it adds to the whole immersion experience and if you're immersed you are enjoying yourself sure. pretty much like, i think in any setting if, if the game got you immersed that's already like a plus, you know what I mean? Because you're already in the environment of it. There's a reason that game, like almost any game worth its salt, plays a lot, pays a lot of attention to atmosphere. Uh, atmosphere is a huge element of any game offering, and it's 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 a critical piece of it for sure. You want to lead us in on co-op versus solo? Oh yeah, we can go co-op. That's what features that enhance the co-op experience versus the solo. Which you know experiences that. It's a, I mean I feel like it's real easy. I'm I feel like just I'm I'm biased myself on that. I think you could probably just go on because I think you have something to say about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean my, my only issue with this is that you you have to you do need to harmonize both parties and that players can indeed enjoy like again you don't have to sacrifice a solo player experience on behalf of the co-op player experience. There, there's no reason that that has to put up be put on the altar of sacrifice so to speak. Uh, and that you need to ignore features for that because a significant body of your player audience is going to be a solo player. Uh, and I think when they talk about this slide, they're talking about it in the sense that solo players need to cooperate with other team members, not necessarily be affiliated with other people. But and, and, and but even in that space, there's no reason that you shouldn't look out for the individual needs of an isolated player trying to enjoy your game and trying to interact with your game. Uh, and, and really provide for that. And I would argue even further that the claims of trying to provide features that enhance the cooperative experience are dreadfully unavailable in this game. Uh, and so we, we have, uh, I think, had no shortage of criticism about the lack of collaboration tools that Foxhole itself provides to its community for a game that is intended to be a huge one large faction versus one large faction. We are missing some critical tools of coordination that are all provided outside of the game to facilitate player engagement. Uh, so every single organization worth its salt is using Discord. If you're not using Discord and you're trying to use in-game comms, you're, ha- you're not doing it as well as you could. Every faction, again, every organization worth its salt uses or used Foxhole Global HQ because the existing in-game map is dreadfully inadequate for coordinating tools, resources, and making plans. Whereas a third-party platform provided not only just a, a little bit better, but an extremely improved delivery system for how a faction could coordinate its resources with one another. And so my my main gripe here isn't necessarily that they're picking, putting co-op versus solo, is that they are trying to they're saying that they're putting the cooperative experience ahead of the solo experience, but I don't see features that lend itself to really embracing that design philosophy, in my opinion. And I may be overly critical. I may be uh, unfair here, but I, I don't feel like my expectations personally as a player and as a consumer of this product are being met in this domain. I, I, I just don't see it. It's, it's it's very interesting, especially, you know, like my solo experience here in Foxhole was probably like, I would say like two weeks and then joined the clan and then became co-op ever since. But one thing I, and I feel like I can say this and again, like, don't quote me, but a lot of I feel like their choice was they want to focus more on just player one, and that just being the person by himself, not tied to anything. But it's real hard to, in, in my eyes, it's real hard to focus on that one person when you're basing a game that's basically about working yeah, as a team. Absolutely, you need to have co-op incentives that it's better working together versus 
by yourself. I'm not trying to say to make that, you know, solo experience horrible. I'm just trying to say, like, it's always better to do it with someone else versus yeah. you doing it by yourself. And those incentives already exist for pragmatic reasons, but players don't recognize them. And so, like you, my first experience with this game was played it for about a month by myself or with one or two buddies. We just logged on and enjoyed it. And the way we enjoyed Foxhole, we don't know what's going on here. We logged in. That looks like there's bad guys. We picked up at the front. We picked up some guns. We ran at the front. We skirmished. We had a good time. That gameplay loop of playing infantry at first introduction was really fun. And then, you know, as time went on, as I tried to explore and enjoy the experience but further, further, I got a little bit more into the depth of the game, I realized how frivolous all that activity was. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, the gameplay loop suffered from the uh, the vanity of the exercise being meaningless. Um, and, and the only way I could see to recapture some of that magic was to get affiliated with a larger group that could actually make a difference. Um, and, and so I think that's a very similar journey that a lot of us that found ourselves in uh, outfits and organizations kind of took. But the more common experience is play, players come to that realization and they quit. They choose a different game. Uh, they don't choose to continue to engage with the product because it's not it's not delivering a sufficient solo player experience. Uh, Fancy Scott into comment here. Could give players pointers each day they log in to trade for crates of supplies, give them a reason to get on. Yeah, possibly. I, yeah, I, I was wondering what some kind of log. Like I had speculated, you know, in in the halls of my in my mind of what it looks like to encourage like daily player participation retention. or some kind of player retention. Uh, some, something to engage players with processes they might not traditionally engage in. So how can you design well, it so that players that don't do logic can still at least rudimentarily, like in some rudimentary manner, contribute to logic in a way that's not a huge time investment? Like what does that look like? And Go ahead. Let me, so I, I think it was you that told me this or someone, but there was this, there's this thing that World of Warcraft has where if you don't log in for, let's just say, at 24 hours you when you log in you get like like what like four like a an fall. hour or two of bonus or what happened some kind of a windfall oh yeah i thought you said my mic fell I was like what <laughs> but, no. um, yeah sometimes like like a, a big boost where you know you're gonna be gathering more experience three times as fast now just to make up for that missed time and I'm not trying to say, you know, implement something like that for Foxhole, but that's just something like, you know, like that's something for you not logging in. So that way you're not wasting that time of, you know, like, oh, I didn't log in yesterday, but you didn't need to. And then, you know, you log in the next day. You don't feel like you just lost that time. At least you get some type of pick me up for that. You know, you get a reason mm -hmm. and plus to like come back, you know. Yeah. And it's, it's a little something like that, you know, we have War Thunder that, you know, gives you a, like, a daily login reward box. So, sure. you know, you come in, log in, get a box. It gets better the more you log in. But it's like, whatever fits well. Because I think it, one thing they what they don't want to do in Foxhole is they don't really want to go into the artificial realm. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to go where things just magically appear from the player. I think they're trying to just stay away from that. And Even I think though that I that's like... fine, but you have to have some incentive for players to interact with you. Right. Let's just let's just let's just spitball for a second. You know what I mean? Like, what could we say right now? Like, what would be some good incentives? Either just playing or keep the reason to keep playing. Let's see. Fancy comment here. That's why I was thinking with a point system, it allows no matter what your playstyle is, you can get some kind of supplies to play with, and if you want more, you have to work for it. And so that's actually a system that's more akin to what PlanetSide offers, and that you know over time you like, at least the way PlanetSide used to offer. I've not played PlanetSide in a long time, but as I remember it, you would have certain cooldowns on how you interacted with vehicles in that case here. But at the same time, you could have a certain accessibility to resources here that you could share with your team just by logging in and contributing some resources. They don't have to be much, but a little bit. Uh, but the other thing is, that in my mind, is progression. You have to have some kind of progression for a player. I think. It, 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 the player has to either has to feel progression in how they are developing and the way they engage with the game, or have to feel progression in, um, like in, in some kind of incentive to play, like some kind of reward. Like in this game, we have a commend system that's not very rewarding. It doesn't incentivize people to play. It's not working to that end. Either, and it's, it's and it's meaningless. Down. And it's meaningless. Like it doesn't mean anything. With the rank as well, like that and the commend system, 
is really just it's just well not the rank the rank is meaningless as itself just shows how much you put time mm -hmm. in the game but the command system all it is is just saying thank you mm -hmm. that's all it is and it doesn't matter how many commands you get because what the, the more commands you get the higher your level is and it's like you just been thanked that many times it doesn't really mean much because no. I, I mean i'm, I'm gonna be I'm a little rude here there's a lot of high-ranking people that are just complete scumbags and it's sure. like you know it is what it is but again it's meaningless the command system in general is not a progression people want to you know get rid of it or change to a different rank just because of the status quo of oh you're oct haha -ha, enjoy that for a while it lasts sure. and it's became like you know a meme but that's not meaningful progression in any sense when you look at what far Soul does offer from progression sense at the start the it, only good i'll say the only the start the only thing i can say is progression is just the tech tree your own person your own inner knowledge of the game exactly. that's the only progression you get is you now know this you now know that carrying g supplies is not actually food you get you know what i mean it's like, like you, you, I mean, I would, if I would have started around that area, I would have carried it. I would have been like, okay, I'm a, like, this looks like food. I'm going to assume I'm going to need a canteen, a can of food, uh -huh. a rifle, 800 mags, because I'm thinking they're bullets. I'm going to live forever. It's like, you know, and then you walk out and <laughs> you die. You know, it's like, oh. You know oh what I mean? It's like, and it, it, it's funny, it's like, unless you have someone specifically telling you, why do you have this like and he gets, it's crazy unless you have someone specifically telling you hey you shouldn't be carrying like this garrison supply in your inventory and i'm just going off for like you know because i know mm -hmm. i would have completely done that i know 100 percent i would have done that because i'm that type of person you know i'm that special kid that would <laughs> completely do that i mean i walk around with a howie show in, in, in my inventory just for good luck <laughs> But you're right, though, because uh, think about, think back to that experience, though, because what, that is something that's interesting. For all of the gripes I have with a new player experience, that first, like, two, three, four weeks you play Foxhole is truly sublime. Like, it really is enjoyable because you're learning so much, and you're growing. So, like, you see material gains in your gameplay and your effectiveness because you're learning all that information uh, haphazardly. And it actually is it's a rewarding to that end. But when that knowledge acquisition stops the the like that player incentive falls off dramatically and suddenly you're just you know grinding for callahan <laughs> so and this is one thing that i mean a, a slight progression because this is where this is just me personally one thing that they could tie in down is more of a proficiency system of the more you do something the better sure. your character becomes at doing that absolutely you know? and it could be tied down to almost any any and every single thing you do in Foxhole. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be ramped up because I know this is one thing they don't want either is they don't want the vet, the veteran player to have advantage of a, of a new player. But I'm just going to say this real quick. There will always be an advantage for the veteran player because of simply they are the veteran player. No, bet, no buffs or whatnot. They will always have the advantage. So it's, and it's like take that mindset out because no matter what, people will have the advantage because they know the game more. And what and I would, new yeah, what I would say in that space is that you make it like per war even. In that, you know, as you play that war, that isolated event, your character as you play that war grows in their capabilities. And I think people will be content with that. They'll, okay, I'm behind this veteran player. He's put a little bit more time in this war. He's a little bit more agile than me. Maybe he's got a little, just a slight accuracy buff, whatever. I'll get him next war, whatever. I mean, that's something like that I know could be really controversial, but it would... Uh, ultimately, yeah, it's somebody getting to Tarkov, but you would, but you'd ultimately be feeding players a reason to play, and that's what this game oh, yeah. is missing right now. You you have to find something, and that that may not be the right incentive, but you need an incentive. And right now, we're missing incentives for players. Right now, we have nothing. We have yeah. nothing after the start. That's like you, you can leave, and then you you know in a month you're like, oh, there's a new update. I'm gonna come in, log in, play like two days, and it's like yeah, it's the same thing. But yeah. you know, back to the uninstall. But like any any type of progression that affects, you know, that affects people's enjoyment. Anything that affects less grinding is ultimately a plus one. Even though I feel like it'd be more of the extreme on what you're saying, instead of per war, I would have just said per life, just to give life oh, more yeah. meaning. Interesting, I love that too. 
and it's like you know what i mean like it's one of those things that logi players could have like these you know more proficient logi based characters where they're like okay i need to keep this and in a sense get me it gets that rust feeling of if i'm scrapping if a partisan comes you know what i mean uh, i don't want to die that's awesome get me? i love that it just ties to everything you know if your that's character beautiful. actually feels like he means something so like even in the front line too like you have these these like don't care for your life comrade get gun get he run at run at the, the structure <laughs> you know what i mean and, and it's, it's our life like, right now and, uh, and life means nothing but imagine you know if you played more safer and it, again this this could affect certain you know some people might not be a fan of it mm -hmm. but i'm just saying like right now like say right now you, you know you have a spawn of you died and you keep going you have that guy that keeps rushing which is pretty much the same you know what you're playing now is what you're facing that you have the sure. green the green fresh recruit and then you have that veteran person that you know he actually like he survived multiple fronts and he's a lot more accurate he gets his accuracy a lot better he's not as yeah, suppressed sure. and like you know, all these other that'd things be sick you know, as hell dude that'd be so sick i know and it just it's just things like that like you know and it even builds to like the experience too is like you know you could say you know hey you know what I've kept this character, and imagine having that character survive from day one of the war to <laughs> the war end. Like I you would, know. I would makes it as a Lodgy boy from day one to the last day. He's like Lodgy, Lodgy. Like Jesus. you wouldn't see any Lodgy boys <laughs> in the front line no more. You wouldn't see any of them memeing oh around. Oh my not god, lose that's so. I mean, I love like, that idea. That's so cool. Like, because I just feel like for Lodgy, it just goes even better. Just like something that. I feel like it could tie down to their, you know. I don't want to die. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the more you produce, the more you make, or the less time it takes, or the you get what I mean. Like things, little subtle things like that, that you know make your character meaningful. And you, yeah. you just add the little thing. And this is just the key thing. Is just if you die, you lose it, and you have to start back again. And the beautiful thing is, like this is what just one idea. There, there are limitless ways you can engage your players, player base with progression. Right? Limitless ways. This idea. Like, it sounds cool to Dark and I, like a bunch of nerds, but this could be horrible for the game. Like, this could absolutely destroy the game. <laughs> yeah, like, we perfectly acknowledge this right here. But something. We need something, right? And I think I think it's okay to acknowledge that. Um, yeah, it, just, it sounds amazing. It yeah. Just, you know, it's yeah, it's yeah. just, if only what we can get, you know? I'm just, like, looking at Company <laughs> Heroes where you have that, that three or five star, you know, yeah, better yeah. Yeah. unit that just is just living juggernauts. But when you're at that point where you lose all but one model, and you're like, oh my god, I gotta get this guy out. Like he yeah, needs sure. to live. And it's like, you know, and it's or it's going back to that rust feeling of you have something to protect now. Your mm -hmm. life actually means something. Even if you, you know, what I mean, it's like uh, now Such a life cool is meaningless. Uh, let's talk a little bit. I mean, we're we kind of end this a little bit, honestly. But let's let's talk about gameplay versus theme here, as you know, we are quickly burning our time. Um, so, so Dark, you want to lead off on this one a little bit? Because I know that you're you're a big, big theme guy. So, I'll be, I'll I, I, I love I, I love to play the game. I love to play the game for the themes, and it's like I, I easily get myself immersed. I'm a passionate role player, and you know, some people hear me either role play as an orc or just you know, a good faithful uh, you know commissar of some sort. Remember, there are certain points of Fox Souls lifetime where I would literally shoot my clan mates that would dare retreat. <laughs> and, but that's like how passionate I was yeah. in the game. You know yeah, I mean? dude. Like, Love it. And it, it, gameplay and theme can fit perfectly. You don't have to fight it with one another. You can perfectly work together in unison. Like a game could be defined by its game. The game's theme can be defined by its gameplay and vice versa. And it's it, it, it's interesting to me where we have this forced theme right now for the factions where the wardens are the strong walls and the colonials are more of the the sneaky flankers i mean i, I, I just very roughly summarizing it you know what i mean but that's a for like this is where it's a forced gameplay theme now you get me where the wardens they kind of have that beneficial of well this is pretty much how tank combat is tanks are made to be stronger in the front that's nothing different but the colonials have more better flanking vehicles which they're still having troubles getting adjusted to this is affecting their gameplay but it's to suit the theme of the game you know yeah. they have all these open tops which you know prior to this update didn't affect anything 
but now they made it, you know, if it's an open top vehicle, it gets 25% more range or more, you know, aiming range, which I feel like that should have just been something for all vehicles in general, but mm -hmm. they had to do something because, you know, I, and I understand people were complaining that, you know, open top means it's, it's vulnerable, but you know, you get me, they, they did make a gameplay based on the theme. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, I don't know. I feel like this shouldn't be a versus. This is more like you know, harmonizing things. With it. Exactly. And I think I think you're. I, I won't add anything else to that. Honestly, I think you hit the nail on the head. There's no reason these things have to compete with one another. Um, and then let's go ahead and hit the last but not least again, if you don't mind. Uh, <laughs> this this one's a really oh, strange yeah. one to me. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not even sure I fully understand this. So if you get this, please let me know. But organic consequences I, versus. I think I can help you for that. I so I think with the going by this, I can give you this example. Let's say, for example, we have a war that's been going on for three months, and the devs really want this update to go on. But this war is literally like all the nukes are, are wasted. It's just a staggering front line. How are we going to, you know, how are we going to, how, how is this going to progress on? The devs have to magically, you know, every day the war, the war, condition is going to lower more and more and more until we finally get a winner they want to avoid situations like that where they have to you know use mag or you know have to mm -hmm. force something when we go to the realm of organic consequences versus artificial it's like when you think of something like oh it, you would think this would happen in real life so it would be gotcha. in game so that's like the, that's that's what in general that's that, that's the general meaning of that okay is you know, in real life, if I, you know, go down on a bike, it's going to, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to go zooming down. In Foxhole, you, you just stop and then the bike goes down fast. You get me? Like the bike doesn't yeah. move. I but, think, I think they missed the mark on this. Like, I, I do think that these compete, but I think that there's more artificial consequences than there organ are organic ones built into the game. Like, I, I hate to be argumentative about that, but I'm thinking specifically about the whole way that building damage works right now. And oh just, yeah, especially just like the, the nonsense big change. Of her, yeah, I mean, ugh, I think the not, like the nonsense with how many HGs it takes to kill a rifle garrison is is mind numbing to me. Uh, so I don't know. This yeah, is I go back this to, is more griping. I go back to that because it's a real easy change. I don't want to change the subject, but I just want to nail this. Go ahead. You know, they have it really focused on. You have to destroy the whole structure as a whole. Just give just give the rifle garrisons its own mm -hmm. HP pool and it, you when you destroy it you just destroy that piece the bunker still lives and it adds another element of gameplay to it because now mm -hmm. guess what you destroyed the bunkers you have a way into the bunker base now right. and now you can flip it or you know use it against them sure but going to that you know we have the artificial consequence of well guess what small arms does absolutely nothing now to structures and it's like it's frustrating because you look in real life. There's a video of what an MG can do to a solid concrete wall, yeah, and yeah. it just it just tears it up. And it's like you know, comparing that to like a foxhole, and it's like you know, so many guns firing at this, and it's just nothing's happening now. Yeah, it's it's a weird situation that, and I, I guess I'm not going to go too deep in in on this. Uh, I, I could, but. This is probably the one I have the least gripe with at the end of the day. Like as far as the comparison, like from as far as the philosophy is concerned, I think it's sound that those well, th two things can compete with each other. Uh, but I think well, they still let me paint you this. Let me picture this so you can understand. I had this big gripe with Foxhole about uh, for some reason different vehicles with the same caliber ammo and oh, different, right and different weapons with the same caliber, they would do different damage for some reason. Magical they would game rules. Yeah, it's like, oh, we need to buff the gunboat. The FMG now does 50% more damage versus the FMG, which still does the same. And it's like, right. I understand you needed to buff its usability, but that's not how you go about it because you're taking away, you're giving, you're taking away the organicness of what we would believe it mm -hmm. would all do the same damage. That's now a you're point. like, and now luckily they they unified, you know. FMG and HMG ammo types, all things, they all fire one. And I feel like you're almost there. There's a few other things that need to abide by this rule. I think carbines and bolt and uh, normal rifles, mm -hmm. they use the same round, you know, like statistic wise. 
but the carbine takes at least three shots to you know knock sure. down versus um, rifle. And I understand people are like, oh, then it will give the rifle no purpose. But it's like there is like you, like for like I want to go back in where you know just because like right now bolt rif uh, rifles are like the main corn of the crop because it's easy to produce. They're the easiest and the cheapest thing to make. So if it's easy and cheap, they'll always be produced. And, the and, rifle and they're be. the best, just so you know, because you're oh, yeah. and You know, it's a lot, it's a lot more accurate, but that's the thing is though, you choose the rifle because it mainly two shots. You get me it's, like it's reliability. I use it for reliability. Good, and the carbine, it, 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 it's, it, it's to me, it's weird because it's the evolutionary step of, of the rifle. You get what I mean? Like it, mm -hmm. it was made to, you know, to, to beat, to, to stop, you know, if rifles were made for, long-range engagement engagements carbines were medium and long and in foxhole it you know it doesn't work that well like it, it kind of just feels like if you're using a carbine you're kind of just shooting yourself in the foot because you could be using a rifle instead but it it just goes to the things like that you know we have the you know like like the armor system like we don't know what on earth you know what i mean like yep like for some reason, you know, you can't damage structures, but you can still take a percentage off of a tank just by shooting at it with a with a like an LMG or um like a, a SMG. You know what I mean? Sure. And we just have that. Like, how does it, how does that work? You know, we have some things that it, did it deflect? Did it really, or did it just take away an HP bar of unknown magnitude? You know what I mean? It's like right on. We we have that. Like armor doesn't work like that in real life. It doesn't no. just choose when it stops bouncing it's that's the armor's thickness either you get a good angle on it or you just don't hit it or you know it wasn't enough to penetrate the armor and it isn't something a tank loses its armor it, it doesn't that's why you have you know like at the time you know you had germany with probably one of the strongest armors because of how they manufactured it they crafted their armors instead of just mass producing you know cheap and disposable ones you know that's why a lot of theirs were harder to hit because of how they you know they forged them and it's just to me it's just a, it's just a frustrating thing you know going on like adding another hp bar that pretty mm -hmm. much you know forces you to do an unnecessary gameplay loop just so that way you're always at your 100 percent. more grind yeah but grind. that's just pretty much the whole that whole like you know topic sure thing so i think um on this slide, I think we're ready to go here. We are a little bit past time, so I'm going to start kind of moving into our closing here. If anybody's got any questions that they want, we'll obviously take a couple minutes to hang back for the chat if it's there. Uh, one kind of um, housekeeping thing uh, that we are considering for next, I know that we're off the leadership development topic here on this space, uh, but we may, if uh, the feedback is favorable, go ahead and actually dive more into balance next cast because we talked about design this cast and design philosophy. Uh, but we did very little talking about the actual balance and the game balance of Foxhole specifically. And I think that there's still a lot of room for discussion in that space. We tried to focus, stay away from balance discussion, but there's a lot to talk about in balance, both uh, from a philosophy perspective and how it's applied to Foxhole. So that's something we're considering. If you got feedback either favorably or negatively, please let us know. We'd love to hear it. Uh, and with that being said, I'm not seeing any questions forthcoming in chat. So... If you get if you fired in under the wire, we'll grab it. But dark, any closing thoughts before we move the stream to a close tonight? Yeah, I just want to just throw another disclaimer out there. You know, we 100% are not in a position to really, you know, judge these decisions as uh, what's what's the right word I'm looking for? Professionals. Professionals, in, in that sense, you know, it's like we just we're real passionate in what we do. We we I, I want to say we love the game. It kind of just feels more, you know, we're, we we're just uh, we're just people that are unfortunately addicted to the game, you know. But we just want to express, and hopefully we've done a good job expressing our concerns, you know, because I, I don't want this to just seem as we're just venting off horrible feedback. Because we the top of the line, we want to give hopefully good food for thought. And some considerations that, that you know, if you're if you're listening to this, that hey, you know, these are an a, in an opinion agreed by some some known veterans, you know, and it's like take what you will. You don't have to do exactly what we're saying, 
It's just as long as you're you know yourself, you're aware. Yeah. I mean, our feedback is ultimately intended to be constructive. We may have missed the mark there, here and there, because of you know the passion associated. Uh, we, we do want to be respectful in our disagreement with choices that are made, and freely admit that you know we don't have all the answers, and that we may not be right about everything. But these are expressions of our experience enjoying this game, and where we feel that there is opportunities to enhance that experience, not only for us, but I hope other players. Uh, and so. It's, it's kind of tough to find that balance, especially when you're excited about something, when you're frustrated and feel that there have been you know, systemic issues that uh, are left unaddressed and we don't feel like we have the reason for that. Or we sometimes even go as far as to say that there's no excuse for that. Uh, and that's, that can be unfair, and that can seem pretty unfair at the end of the day. But it's worth acknowledging that we're trying to do, you know, talk about this in the spirit of uh, constructive criticism, I guess. That's one thing, you know, hopefully we can try to do a better better stand off i don't we i don't really want us to come off as you know oh these guys are just here talking smack again it's like no like yeah. we're trying our best to be as respectful as possible like and then i want to say please don't take this with any ill will you know what i mean like we say this because we love what i mean we love the game and we want it to improve for the better we don't want people to you know we're, we're tired of people leaving and whatnot we don't know every solution just like he said but we just want, hopefully, a, a leap of good faith that at least we know the direction it's going. Because currently, right now, we're we're just we're concerned. Absolutely. That's just the bottom line. We're just concerned that you know the, the certain big the big numbers coming and you know it. We don't want a rabbit out of the hat of well, guess what? Either you like it or you don't. And it's like you know, it, it's like it's like you, you know you're riding a train and unfortunately you're in the first seat and the first seat is literally right where the driver's at. You can't really move. You are just seeing straight ahead. <laughs> and what you see is, you know what I mean? Like, I don't want yeah. to say a broken bridge, but it, it looks a lot like a broken bridge. And you're just like, yo, you know what I mean? Turn, you know what I mean? Like, like, <laughs> yeah, I, know I don't have, dumb. I don't have my glasses on, but that looks like a broken bridge. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I can't see it, but it doesn't look safe. I'm worried. And it's something like, you know, at least oh, I feel great. like a lot of a lot of people have that feeling of we're just worried and we don't want to be worried. We want to feel assured. We want to feel happy with the current product we're given. You know what I mean? It's just That's it's awesome. just rough right now. I love that Dirk. Thank you, thank you. Guys, Sometimes I have my moments. <laughs> guys, we're gonna go ahead and cut the stream there. We appreciate you taking your time with us this evening. Have a good night.